If you follow contemporary food issues, you might already be aware that in both this country and around the world, more and more people are working together to try to change their food systems and make them more healthy, equitable, and sustainable. They're grappling with everything from hunger and nutrition to genetic engineering to the loss of fertile soil to the effects of climate change on agriculture and much, much more. These efforts and struggles are not only about food, they're also very much about democracy. Who controls food and how? Who should control food? These questions lie at the heart of the idea of food democracy, which is what we want to talk with you about tonight. Food democracy is the notion that people can and should have the power to meaningfully participate in determining what their food systems are like. Now, by food system, I'm referring to all of the stages that are involved in feeding a population. So from growing, harvesting, processing, transporting, marketing, and eating food. So I'm going to try to make this idea of food democracy a little more concrete for you. Mark and I um, have been deeply involved in the effort to, uh, for local foods. And the local food movement in North America is an extremely visible example of innovation and civic participation. Mark and I have been working on this together since 2003. We're, he we're here at the University of Montana where I'm a professor of environmental studies. Mark is the director of dining. In 2003, we began collaborating when a group of my students decided they wanted the university to buy more local food. Mark was really excited by the uh, idea when he had some student help, and the U of M Farm to College program was launched. But it turns out that the simple idea of buying local is actually fairly complicated in practice. It wasn't always complicated. This is a picture of Hughes Gardens, taken around 1900. This garden and others like it fed the people in the Missoula area well into the 20th century. Our area had a vibrant food processing industry that included fruit and sugar beets, meat packing, flour milling, dairying, and much more. Now, this picture was taken from the same spot a couple of years ago. The two images together tell the story of change. Change in the food system that's occurred not just in our little corner of the world, but almost everywhere. The loss of farmland you see here, the interstate running through it, symbolize how most of us in North America have become dependent on food from far away and, therefore, on the, trans on the fossil fuel and transportation networks that are required to bring it to us. In Montana today, about 90% of the food we eat comes from someplace else. But the thing is, we're not unique. The central characteristic of the dominant food system is distance. I'm not only talking about the physical distance that food travels from where it's grown to where it's eaten, I'm also talking about the social distance and the knowledge gap that's been created. Most North Americans know very little about the food they eat. We know very little about the ecological and social conditions under which it's grown, or how it reaches our plates. So, there are certainly benefits to this global food system, right? We can all sit here and think of those. 
but it's basically controlled by a few multinational agribusiness corporations. For example, just three firms based in the United States control the vast majority of grain that moves around the world. Four firms control 82% of the beef packing in the United States. And I could go on and on with examples from throughout the chain. But so if the dominant food system is characterized by distance and control by a few, the movement for food democracy is characterized by connection and by the participation of many, many individuals and groups. So what happens when food citizens decide to take back some control? Well, you know, Neva, uh, when we started the UM Farm to College program, it wasn't to create food democracy or food citizens. The truth is, we didn't even know those terms. We simply believed it was the right thing to do. We wanted to create a network of local food producers through relationships that could be sustained over time. Many local food programs are designed around a distance from a central point. For example, local might be defined as food purchased within, say, 250 miles. Our program, however, is different in that it is specifically designed to strengthen agricultural economic development throughout Montana. Ten years ago, we were purchasing $150,000 in local food from seven vendors. And today, we're purchasing over $800,000 annually from 128 Montana farmers and ranchers. And this represents... And this represents nearly a quarter of our $3 million annual food budget. And while we're proud of our accomplishments, the real value has come from the lessons that we've learned along the way. There is so much more than just, say, the financial bottom line or uh, racking up the total numbers of food purchases from local purveyors. In fact, we used to buy all of our food from one primary source, and that was really easy for us. However, changing to multiple local sources was not easy. So to make our program successful, we started with what we thought was the low-hanging fruit, wheat, cooking oil, and beef. And you know, in Montana, there are more cattle than people. But it turned out that finding a reliable source for local beef was one of the hardest things we had to do. In fact, we worked with four different Montana uh, beef producers and none of them could provide the volume uh, that we needed. So where is the local beef? Well, a lot of people, and I believe too many people, think that this, this, is where beef comes from. But in 2010, at a uh, meeting of the Western Sustainability Exchange, I met two forward-thinking Montana ranchers, Brian Ulrich and Zach Jones, from Yellowstone Grass-Fed Beef. And now, for us, this, this place and these people, this is where our local beef comes from. Our initial conversations with them centered on our Farm to College program, and their interest in selling us their grass-fed, grass-finished beef. And we were particularly interested in grass-fed beef because it's higher in nutritional value and lower in saturated fat. But I also learned that their award-winning sustainable ranching practices were in perfect alignment with our sustainability philosophies, and most important, that they actually could produce all of our beef. And then that was when the real work began. There were so many details that had to be worked through. Uh, coordination of production, establishing pricing, uh, working with the meat packer, finding a distributor, and then establishing delivery schedules. It wasn't easy, but the strength of our relationship is such that we can work through the challenges. 
Now, our first year business with them was critical for them because it represented over half of their total annual sales. And now, just three years later, we're purchasing three times as much beef and their total beef production has quadrupled. And commodity uh, beef market pricing is volatile. But we have an annual contract with Yellowstone grass-fed beef that guarantees them sales volume and us with fixed annual pricing. On an institutional level, we've reduced food miles, we've accessed healthier and fresher food, we've established relationships built on trust, and we're creating a thriving learning laboratory. We're even transforming the way our culinary staff and our students and our guests think about food systems. And these transformations are especially possible because we work in an educational institution where we're all learning from each other all the time. But at the end of the day, we are a business enterprise and we are required to produce net revenues. And I'm happy to report that we have a 10-year record of maintaining our food costs well within industry standards and we're meeting all of our institutional financial obligations. So, Neva, while we did not start out to create food democracy, we have moved from being passive consumers to being active food citizens. So Mark's story shows how building sustainable local food systems requires new markets. And these new markets need to be based on new kinds of relationships and on shared values like trust, a commitment to mutual well-being, a sense of place. Community food advocates have also found that we need to do the exciting but challenging work of rebuilding infrastructure, like food processing facilities and distribution services that are scaled to meet our local and regional food needs. We're literally trying to work at every stage from field to fork to make our systems here more sustainable for, the, for people and the planet. Now change, it's not just going to come from the consumer choices that you and I make. It's going to take what I call food citizens, people who are actively engaged in building their own food systems. People like the students who decided to get the university to buy local food. People like Mark, who grabbed onto that goal, championed it, and was willing to overcome the obstacles to move towards it. And it's people like the Montana ranchers who are using conservation practices, producing a healthier product, and developing markets that aren't controlled by big beef. Food democracy is really, it's a process for moving towards sustainability and justice. And to get there from here, it's going to take more and more people getting involved as active food citizens in making decisions and building solutions together in community. If we cultivate food democracy, we just might be able to create the kind of food systems we need, desire, and deserve. Thank you. <laughs>